Hello and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. It's our pleasure to have you join us. My guest on the program today says there's been a sea change for the better in the structural framework of the mining sector in Nigeria to eliminate illegal operations. My guest also says the Ajaokuta steel complex and associated industries have suffered from setbacks brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, but that now a plan is in place for its resuscitation and operations, which will involve no further investment from government. Newsnight talks to the Minister of Mines and Steel Development, Ola Milekon Adegbite. Honorable Minister, thank you for your time. Welcome. Thank you. Let me begin from what is about the most current thing. Uh, a lot of attention has been paid to mining and steel development, even though for different reasons. Uh, and one of the things that's been happening over the last five years is reforms in the sector, uh, various types of reforms, streamlining and all that. Where are we with that today? Well, I think um, we made more progress uh, and have more successes in, in mining than in steel development. Uh, in steel development, we've had our challenges and we've had our successes. Uh, there are a lot of uh, private sector steel production that has come on stream in the last five years due to you know, the policy uh, making life easier for everybody, ease of doing business, and of course, uh, there are a lot of incentives promoting steel production. So a lot of the private sector have taken advantage of this. And like I said, we have a, a lot of successes there. Uh, the, the issue around steel production has to do with the government project. Uh, the Albatros, if you like, Ajakuta uh, Steel Company, uh, which of course has its challenges, and the challenges are subsist. But when it comes to mining, we've made a very good headway, and uh, uh, we're on our way to becoming a mining destination on the world map. So. Now, you, uh, let me take first, as you said, then the mining uh, before we come to steel. In the case of the mining, some of what has brought it to prominence has been illegal mining going on in different parts of the country. I mean, if I take the example of Zamfara, um, the insecurity in Zamfara, some have put partly to the fact that a lot of illegal mining is going on or was going on in that area and that there wasn't much attention being paid to it until it became a security concern. Um, now, with what you talk about, the ease, the streamlining of the processes and all of that, has that changed the situation, not just in Zamfara, in the other places where illegal mine, because from the research I have, there's virtually solid minerals everywhere in Nigeria, that, so this situation could be replicating itself virtually anywhere. Well, illegal mining actually, uh, if you want to put it that way, has been around uh, for as long as you want to say it. There are a lot of places where, uh, even before mining became regulated, you know, having a ministry and all that, it was the occupation of the people there. Uh, all they did was they woke up one day and, you know, they found something under their soil and they made use of it for economic uh, benefits. So, in quote, if you want to call that illegal mining, it's been on for forever. But what has happened in a place like Zamfara? It's where what you call illegal mining has been on. Then the banditry came. And of course, banditry taking advantage of proceeds of mining to fund and fill the banditry itself. You know, gold, been very abundant in, uh, in Zamfara. Your mine gold, it transfers, translates to money immediately, cash. You know, if you have gold, you can get cash immediately. And don't forget that a lot of people keep their, uh, the, the wealth in, in gold, yeah. which is almost as, uh, as good as cash. So that is what has fueled the banditry. The legal money had been going on, which was under control. You know, we have intervention forces. You, you have activity and you stop it, nip it in the board. But then, when the banditry came in, it became something that was beyond uh, what the ministry could handle. And of course, you had to bring in the military. Uh, Federal government had to bring its mics there 
And even as we speak, mining is banned in Zamfara. Uh, there's no mining. Government took some extreme measures uh, recently when they put down all the network in Zamfara just to stop communication right. uh, to, and to uh, stop this banditry. But elsewhere, where illegal mining is strictly for economic reasons, you know, people who want to feed, whether they're locals, whether they're foreigners who come in illegally. We're dealing with that, and we have successes on that. We've arrested a few people. Uh, we'll get to hear about it. You know, Nigeria being a vast country, you never know what's going on, because most of this thing happened in very remote forest, you know. But then we do get to hear of it, and we've just acquired some technology air in the head office here. Uh, it's called remote sensing. We have that platform here, and we can focus on any part of Nigeria. It can tell us what's going on there at that time, and then we we'll deploy an intervention force uh, to stop that. So, as far as illegal mining is concerned in the country, uh, we're on top of that. You know, we're nipping it in the bud, especially in those areas where it's not mixed with banditry. Where it's mixed with banditry, that is the, it becomes the exclusive preserve of the military. The federal government is taking out of that through the military, and uh, I think they are achieving some uh, uh, success in those areas. That's illegal. Now come to the legal one, the one that people are doing with licenses. You know they're there. You know what they're producing, how much of it, where they're taking it to, and all that. They're legal. But there were, as shall we say, some untidy parts in terms of the framework of how you secure a mining license. Um, who you go to compensation for land that is then used for mining, those who were on it before you acquired for mining and all that. Uh, where are we with that? For example, start with the issue of who issues mining licenses, federal, the ministry, or states? Well, mining, uh, it's the exclusive preserve of the federal government. That's what the constitution says. and. Uh, People will understand it better when you look at it from the part of oil and gas. Oil and gas is also mining. It's just what you have in this place is liquid and uh, gas. That's what we have in oil and gas. So it's also mining. In fact, in some of our, our neighbors and other African countries, the Minister for Mines is also the Minister for Petroleum. That's what happens in South Africa. The, the Minister of Mines is also the Minister in terms of Petroleum and, uh, and I think also in Ghana and a few other countries. Uh, Burkina Faso is another one. I've met the Minister who is the Minister for Mines and Petroleum because Petroleum and Gas is also mining. Now, nobody has disputed the fact that the federal government controlled uh, oil and gas. But you see, we had the issue because of the ease and the relative ease of getting uh, the solid minerals out of the ground. So you're the ones close to the surface. You know, with oil and gas, it's at great depth. You need some technology to get there and all that, you know. But with some simple implement tools and all that, you just dig the ground. Maybe at, at, at about 10 feet, you start uh, getting some minerals. So individual got into that, and that caught, uh, created some confusion. But then the constitution is very clear. The law is very clear. Federal government controls mining. Now... Uh, we've had to do a lot of uh, meetings, you know, reaching out to the local government, the state government, and we've achieved uh, relative uh, calm, if you want to call it. Now we're having cooperation with the state governments, you know, because we're saying that the states can participate in mining, but not as subnationals, but they should have to come as corporates, just like every other, uh, every, uh, other person. Now, Oshun State is a good example. I've cited it severally. Oshun State has 10 licenses, but not as Oshun State government, as Omolu Abi Mining Company. When they come to us, we treat them like any corporate. Come, you know? So, if you want to do mining, you can't come to me as an individual. Mr. Ladia no. You have to form a company. It could be Ladia Akredolo and Co. So, if it's a limited ability company that's well registered in Nigeria, Yes, you, you fulfill some uh, obligations and then we, we grant you those licenses. So we are telling the states, and the states are cooperating. Yes, they're coming to mining, but as corporates. Recently, I think about two, three months ago, uh, we also had uh, a session, a workshop for the 704 local governments uh, in Nigeria. It was an online thing, it was declared open by the VP, where we were telling the local government people, 
their roles in mining to enhance uh, uh, what the, the investors experience within their jurisdiction because mining takes place in a specific location which falls, of course, in one local government or the other. Yeah. So this is a part of the thing to clear that part. And we are, I think we are, we are clear on that. Uh, everybody is beginning to understand their roles. And furthermore, the 13% derivation that is in oil and gas is also in mining. So whatever revenue comes to the Federation account through mining, the states that which it comes from get 13% first before the rest is thrown into the pool, just as it's done in uh, oil and gas. So there's 13% right. derivation for every state. Uh, so we're getting uh, very clear on that. When it comes to actually giving license, there were a lot of lessons learned from the oil and gas saga, you know, where we had problems, you know. We talk of the mobile compound in Eket, and then you have this El Dorado in the midst of poverty. That is changing. In mining, before you can even get a license, you must go, we call it community consent. That is, the people who own the land must give you consent. So you as a person, the corporate body, must go to that locality where you want to mine and tell them what you want to do, tell them your intentions. And you have to convince them to give you a consent to use their land. If you don't have a consent, no matter what, you could have billion dollars worth of deposit there. Nobody's going to give you a license. So the community consent... And this, my apologies for interrupting, this concept, uh, consent you talk yeah. about could also include compensation to those who will give you the consent. They you must see, be satisfied. What is most important to us is that see, the consent must come willingly and in written form. And then you must swear an affidavit to it. And you convince them. It's not left to you as corporate. But we do not... Uh, prescribe. Because, we do not prescribe compensation or even encourage my investors to purchase the land because that puts on necessary burden. Because money doesn't take place in a small area. You're not buying a plot. You could have an area as vast as... Um, le 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 let's look at an area where we are all familiar with. You know where your office is. Right from the junction to where your office. That could be a mining location for just one company. We, it's measured in cadastre. And one cadastre unit is about 10 hectares. Right. You know, sorry, it's about one hectare. That's 10,000 square meters, not 10 hectares, sorry. It's about one hectare. So you're, you're working on a vast area. So you, it's impossible for you to say you want to list the land. The cost will be too prohibitive. So our big issue is going to send investors away. So what we encourage is that let it convince the community of the benefits that could come to them. It's better that way. You may have to do some compensation for crops, especially in areas where you have economic crops, or even uh, annual crops on the ground. You may have to do some uh, compensation in terms of cash for that. But we do not encourage people saying they want to lease the land or buy the land. It creates a burden, you know, and uh, it is incentive to investors. So essentially, you get a consent. But I must say there's something called, the consent is the first thing. There's another thing called CDA, Community Development Agreement. Before you commence operation, after you have that consent, we'll give you a license. But well, you cannot commence operation until you have a CDA. This is something that is codified, is written down, signed by everybody, and of course witnessed by us, who are the umpire. In this CDA, it's done in five yearly installments. This is essentially a set of promises graduated to the community. You can say, for, for instance, in the CDA, first year, I'll give 20 uh, members of this community scholarship to their secondary school. That could be your first thing. Because, you see, when you come into mining, you're going to be investing a lot of money, and you're not making any money of an issue. Ab initio is a lot of investment to acquire your data. You need to know where your deposit is exactly. You're working in an area as big as this office, and it is just nestled under there. You sit there, and you don't know. You have to find that out at what depth. It's only when you found all that facts before you can now begin to develop and then bring out the product and sell, and you make money. This normally takes between three to five years. So your promises are graduated based on that. You're not making money, but you need to show good faith. So in year one, I'm going to give you 10 scholarships. I'm going to give you 20. By year five, I'm going to build a road or bring electricity to this community. So this is CDA that is signed. The community you know, must be developed along. As you prosper, the community must prosper along with you. These are some of the lessons I said we learned from the Niger Delta uh, in oil and gas. The oil and uh, gas yeah. issue. So that as, as the investor prosper, the community must also grow and prosper along. And of course, this, uh, this of course is codified in the Act, 2007 uh, Mining Act. And of course, this is guiding and it's helping because whoever is doing mining properly uh, has to do all this. And then we come in, while we moderate, we moderate the expectations of the community, we also ensure that the investor does not 
uh, cheat the community. So everybody uh, is in harmony. The other aspect which we have seen in other jurisdictions uh, outside Nigeria where they do large-scale mining, the sort of which we are embarking on now, is the environmental impact uh, of the mining activity itself on the immediate community and the surrounding area. So even assuming that all what you have outlined is done by this uh, uh, miner, uh, when they actually start doing the mining, they produce some byproducts, whether they are gases or actual waste products and so on. They do that. Uh, what happens to those? Well, sorry. I, you see, uh, I didn't give you all the requirements, you know, before you get your license. One of that is that you must get your uh, environmental impact analysis approved and signed by the Ministry of Environment. That's even done outside us. So that's also important. You must have, have done employed experts who will do a report and of course the mitigation of all that impact is contained in that report it must be approved by the ministry of federal ministry of environment not the state the federal ministry of environment must approve that report before we can grant you a license to start so the environmental factors are taken care of in that you know what you want to mine mining by nature is destructive because what you are looking for is under the ground and you're not exact as to where it is so in the exploration process, you just keep boring holes all over the place, looking for where it is, at what depth, until you get the location, you have the data, and then you can start developing that area. And of course, there's also a remediation plan, which is part of what you submit as well, before you get the license. It's also, so the requirement is quite uh, lengthy. You, you have to come with a remediation plan. Um, let's say you're mining gold or you're mining lead. Yes, what is there is finite. That is, it's limited. No matter how bulky, no matter the volume, you know, maybe it will take you 100 years to mine. There's a remediation plan after the mining, and not until you finish finally. What we do is that, you see, once you, you could be mining all over this office, maybe your deposit is here. But as you finish in that corner, you must put that corner back to good use. And of course, what we found out is the land has been mined, you know, the soil has been turned around, they become more fertile. So it's very good for agriculture, the land has been restored. So that's also in the remediation plan. And we also have a situation where you contribute to a fund, you know, for remediation. That fund is refundable when you do remediation by yourself. So you contribute as you mine. You contribute to that fund. But in case you do not do what you're supposed to do, there's a fallback position. It's like an insurance. We can use that fund to do what you ought to have done. But it's better if you do it yourself. You do the remediation. And, of course, you get your refund. Uh, from the Mo fund. Most of those who go into mining because of the technology involved in our own system, of course, are foreigners. Uh, although I do know that the, the governments at various levels, as you pointed out, have started uh, getting into it uh, at various levels, which brings up the issue of monitoring, uh, which, of course, we also had as a problem in oil and gas earlier, which is you give the license, they go there, there's the plan, you've pointed out, they've gotten all the approvals and so on. And then it brings up the question of monitoring to ensure that what it is they've agreed with you here in Abuja is what they are doing in wherever it is across the country that they're actually carrying out the activity. How do you ensure that it's not when it becomes a real big problem? For Again, I give this Amfara example where we had lead poisoning, uh, even though that was the result possibly of illegal activity. But it became a problem subsequently, whoever it was that was doing the mining. How do you ensure that in the various parts of the country where it's going on? I mean, we, we know that behind you, here in this office, are a variety of uh, solid samples. minerals and samples of solid minerals, uh, and I'm sure they come from different parts of the country. How do yeah. you ensure that in all those places where all these activities are happening simultaneously, you have an eye on them, right from, you talked about the remote sensing uh, earlier, is that what keeps an eye on all those places? No, we, we go beyond that. And I think I will go back. Let me answer your question directly, then I need to go back so that we, we are educated about the money that's going on in Nigeria as of now. One, uh, the ministry has presence in every state of the federation, including the Federal Capital Territory. And that presence is headed by what you call a federal mines officer, who is the most senior person in that. And then we've got a complement of staff. Uh, when you get a license to mine, the first port of call is that uh, office, the state office, 
for instance, you get a license to mine in Niger State, you must first go to our office, go and register your presence with the federal mines officer. Oh, I've got this, and I'm coming to work in this uh, town, which is under our direction. The man notes it down, you know. So it becomes familiar that a new operator has come into my space, and they monitor them. He has a complement of staff that monitor this. Also, you know, the natives around where you work, they also monitor, and we get a lot of feedback from them. Then we have another mechanism. It's called Miremco. It's mine uh, a committee that is actually set up. Uh, it's part of the act. But what essentially that does is to give the governors uh, a say in what happens in their jurisdiction. The chairman of Miremco in every state is the mining committee. The chairman of the Miremco is chosen by the governor of that state. In that Miremco, uh, you have our FMO is represented. The local government is represented. Various uh, stakeholders. stakeholders are represented on that committee. And that committee is the first point of, if there's any dispute that you go to, like if a miner is having issue with his host community or is having issue with another miner, the Miremco, which FMO is also part of, try to solve that problem. It's the only way they are unable to that they escalate it to the, uh, fair, to the headquarters, uh, the office there. But let me tell you the mining that goes on in Nigeria now, so we get it clear. We have if you like, three categories of miners in Nigeria now. We have those we call outright illegal miners. These are essentially foreigners who come into our shores without recourse to us. They go into the bushes and then they start mining. These are illegal people. We have a few Nigerians who maybe from ancestry, this is what they've always had, had their parents doing and they're doing the same thing. They are mining for their subsistence living. These are called artisanal miners. The but just to be clear, it's illegal because they don't have licenses from you. Well, le le let me say, that's where I'm coming. They are called artisanal miners. And right now, we do not consider them as illegal. Because, you see, what government has realized is that, and most other countries, they uh, uh, actually come to recognize artisanal miners. They are mostly citizens of that country who are engaged traditionally and you know, using sim uh, simple implement to, of course, uh, just support their living. These are artisanal miners. Why we do not categorize them as illegal totally? The moment you criminalize them and throw them out of that, you create idle hands, which becomes the devil's workshop. They could now be engaged in other things. Because these artisanal miners in Nigeria today, they form about 95% of the workforce. So you can see those, those people are engaged there, which otherwise could have been doing some nefarious activities. So they are engaged in mining. So what government does is that we organize. There's a department in the ministry. It's called Artisanal and Small Scale Mining Department. What that department is, is saddled with is go out there, identify the uh, artisanal miners, and try to organize them into groups. And we've done this successfully. We have uh, over 100 groups that have been re recognized like that. We encourage them, maybe in groups of 10 or 15, to form cooperatives. When they form cooperatives, we give them incentives, we train them, we give them a uh, loan 5%, uh, at 5% interest rate, long term. We give them training, we give them equipment, this, all these, so that we can organize them into groups that now becomes beneficial to themselves and to the society. Because when we organize them like this, we grant them what we call small scale mining lease. It's not the kind of lease that the big guys get. The small scale mining lease will allow them to be organized they can now work properly. They are now licensed. We've taken them away from artisanal into small-scale mining lists. But then we have to first recognize them and organize them. And we've had some successes on this. So they become small-scale. Um, and it's only when, you are, when we are recognized that you can now pay revenue. What you actually pay is what you call reality. Yeah. Whatever you, you win from your mining, you pay 3% uh, to 5% maximum. Uh, depends on what kind of mineral. And gold is about 3%. Uh, of the value. That's what you pay as royalty to government. Who determines the value? Oh, yes, us. Uh, well, for, for instance, like gold, uh, the value is known worldwide. I mean, the international uh, market. Yes, price. international market. Yes, the value is now. If you are doing lead, we know how much lead is uh, selling for, so we can determine the value and then you pay 3% uh, of that. Everybody knows that. Now, that's uh, the second category. Then the other category are the organized miners who come into the country or who are. Uh, local investors who come to us have an issue, I want to mine, and they go through that process I was telling you about. 
So those are the three categories. The artisanals are in Nigeria today maybe about 90 to 95 percent of the total of the total people mining. So government is not deriving so much yet in terms of revenue for mining because of that. But government is spending money to organize these people. We spend a lot of money, we we'll go out there, and even the remote sensing is more targeted at them. Because with the remote sensing, we can see where some artisanal mining is going on, or where mining activity is going on. We go there, if it's artisanal miners, like I said, they are Nigerians. You can't be a foreigner and be artisanal, no. That's a legal pure. We send those away, we arrest them. So once we recognize that activity, we, of course, put them in groups, organize them into cooperatives, and then they can go on with whatever they are doing. Then, of course, the third group is the people who are doing mining properly in, in, in Nigeria. They have licenses and there are, there are quite a few uh, of them doing that uh, in Nigeria today. So that, those are the three groups. And then we identify them for who and what they do. Still, on the other hand, as important as it is, uh, very, very important, has proved to be more of a naughty problem yeah. uh, or a naughtier problem. And as you pointed out, the Ajakuta steel complex is like the flagship that has refused to sail. Um, 40 years, 50 years now, that idea under General Gawan. Um, the Russians built that plant in Ajakuta. As I was telling you before we came on, I visited it in 2007 and uh, we were taking round. Before that, I had, I had been there in 2005, uh, and on both occasions, spending three or four days, we still couldn't cover the entire complex. I mean, there were schools built there, there were housing estates built there. Several estates. So many things are there. There's a power plant. Uh, this is all outside the steel uh, complex it's itself. It was built as a self-sufficient town. And it's not been in use. It's called a steel city. It's not about been in three use. times the size of federal capital territory. Exactly. It's not been in use, uh, Minister. And hopes were raised when the president, uh, 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 as represented, was in Russia, and there was some agreement with the Russians who built it to say they'd come to take a look at it. I mean, maybe they have to alter some of the technology because that's so long ago. What's the situation with Ajakuta today? Well, Ajakuta is an unfortunate challenge uh, to the country. Like you said, I'll take it from when I came into office. You know, we were sworn in uh, August 21 in 2019. And like maybe just about two months after that, we had the uh, Russian African Summit in Sochi in Russia. And it was at that summit that there was a bilateral on the sideline with President Putin and President Muhammadu Buhari sitting down face to face, and I was sitting with President Buhari because essentially we're asking them to support us in Nigeria, among some other requests. And the Russians uh, acquiesced. President Putin promised to support uh, Nigeria to actualize Ajakuta, uh, other summits. Uh, that was October 23, 24 of 2019. And we came home uh, with a lot of expectation and high hopes. And I went to town, I told the people that, look, yes, we will fix Ajakuta. Because we now had a clear vision of what we wanted to do. We had the funding uh, promised and everything. So it was just to implement. But as uh, luck will have it, first major came in, the pandemic. Because the first thing to do with Ajakuta, everybody agreed, was what they call a technical audit. Ajakuta had been on for so long. Now we need to do a technical audit, which essentially is to look at the situation of Ajakuta. Uh, the, the present the, situation. Yeah, present it? situation. That's what an audit does. You know, they come in there, and the audit team was already formed. 60 Russians were going to come in. 100 Nigerians, well trained. Uh, government has spent a lot of money on these people. 100 Nigerians, 160 of them will take about 90 days. They look at the Yakuta nitty gritty in details and tell you, oh, this needs to be done. This needs to be, this is still okay and all that. So that. Uh, the, the technical audit was supposed to take about 90 days. It was supposed to start in March. Then the pandemic came in. And I must tell you, it's unfortunate. Up till now, we've not been able to do that. The pandemic, essentially. You know, we thought, okay, it went down, and we're going to come in December of last year. Then the third wave or second wave started. And we've been having that. Now we've come to the conclusion that, yes, the pandemic is probably here to stay. You know, we keep adding up different variants. 
and everybody is learned to adapt. We're, we're learning to live with it. So we're saying, okay, the Russians are ready to come. The president has approved the funding for them. So we are good to go. Uh, I'm hoping that because it's already end of the year, maybe they will come here early January to, to start that process. What I probably would need to do, I've said this, uh, I can go back to Nigeria. You know, maybe at the end of, the ten, of my tenure in, in this office and apologize that, yes, we made a promise that we'll fix the Akuta before we left office, but we're unable to do so for social reasons. But then I pray and hope that we will have started an irreversible process by the time we're leaving. Because once the audit is done, in fact, there's a scramble. I have about six or seven options now. People who want to do a Jakuta, and that is the way to go. It's not concessioning. It's PPP. Whoever must come to run a Jakuta and must have a skin in the game. You must have your own funds there so that the success is guaranteed. It's not somebody who's just had a concession. It's a free ride, and which is some of the mistakes they made in the past. And they put us more. By the time they leave as a concessionaire, we are in deeper problem than when they came in. We don't want that anymore. So, but now we've got very good proposals from Nigerians who have formed uh, alliances with some uh, foreign experts, from even foreign experts that are coming directly by themselves without any alliance. We're going to sit down. Uh, we're employing a transaction advisor on that as well. The funding for that has also been approved. The transaction advice is going to look at all the options. But then, this can only be done in detail. You need to know what you have on your hands. We must have the technical audit report. The technical audit report tells you you need to fix A, B, C. It's going to cost you X naira, X dollars. That is going to be available to all these investors that are interested. Look, this is what you want to come into. So you know the picture before you buy into it. They're not going to give us their solution, their proposals. The trans transaction advisor will look at all that proposal, rank them, and give us results. And this is what we take to council. The federal government will now decide who to go with. But like I said, Whatever is done in Yakuta, it will not be a burden on government or on the Federation. It's going to be a burden on the business itself. So whoever is coming must give us a business case. We have the fund promised. So, okay, if I get this fund, I fix a Yakuta. If I start producing, you know, uh, a Yakuta can do up to, it starts very small, maybe about 1.3 metric tons. It can go up to 5.2 metric tons and all that. And that's a lot, you know. We can start supplying even our neighbors when a Jakuta begins to process. So from your proceeds, you know, profit, whatever, you can pay back the loan and all that. So these are part of the uh, plans and proposals that will be given. After you've been availed the technical audit report, you can now come back and say, yes, this is what I want to do. And then they will rank that to the proposal, and then we'll leave the decision to uh, the president and the council to decide who to give a Jakuta to. But that in a nutshell, that's what we are working on now. And that's the plan. There are associated projects to Ajaukuta. There were projects that were put in place that Ajaukuta was like the mothership for. Uh, as you were speaking, uh, Delta Steel came into mind. The Oshogbo Steel Rolling Mill came into mind. There's an iron ore uh, thing in Itakbe. Yes. Uh, just to mention a few. There are others. Uh, okay, what's happening with those ones? Let me explain all of them. Uh, and some are dependent, some are not dependent. One, Ajakuta itself, as a steel plant, is dependent on Neomko, Nigeria Iron Ore Mining Company in Itape, because to make steel, iron ore is the major ingredient, maybe about 90, 95% of what you need. The other little are uh, just... Uh, okay, so that, that Neomko so, you Neomko, is also yes. going to be part of this audit. It has to be. Yeah, oh, it's part of this audit. Right. Neomko and Ajakuta and Siamese twins. They go together. Neomko only produce raw material for Ajakuta. And that's a, 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 a real link between uh, Itape and Ajakuta itself. There's a real link dedicated for that. Yes. Because uh, iron ore is a very heavy thing. You can't take by road. You know? So there's a real link. They load them into all these uh, wagons and psh, it goes down to Ajakuta and then processing starts. So the technical audit is inc includes uh, Itape. That's Neomko and Ajakuta itself. Right. Delta Steel is a different thing. It's, Delta Steel is a miniature of Ajakuta, but with a different technology. While Ajakuta is built to produce from blast furnace, uh, Delta Steel in uh, Alaja was meant to produce from arc furnace. What's the difference? Well, if you want to produce steel on a large scale that's done all over the world now, it's still the blast furnace, the Ajakuta system. Okay. Yeah. The arc furnace is a more modern system. 
you know, but not at the same scale, scale of Ajakuta. Of that. Okay. So what we have in, uh, it was fully owned by government, both of them at one point. So Itakwe was like in the middle. Itakwe has, uh, has about 38 kilometers of rail into Ajakuta and about 60 something kilometer into uh, Alaja. That rail line is, was dedicatedly built for steel production. So Itape will produce iron ore for Alaja to use his arc furnace. They will produce iron ore for Ajakuta to use his blast furnace. That's what it was going for. But somehow along the line, Alaja was privatized. It's now in private hands. Uh, it, so it's no longer part of... It's no longer part of government consideration. It belongs to a private uh, company. It's been named Premier still. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's been privatized. Now, to come back to your question, there are some industries that were built that will be dependent on Ajakuta's product. That's Ushugo Sterole Mill, Casina Sterole Mill, just Sterole Mills. Those ones were based on the offtake, whatever, they, they, what, they, what, what they needed to survive will come from Ajakuta. And that's why they've been stifled. And they're are, virtually dead because well, they haven't well, gotten those no, materials. No, they're not dead. They what are they doing? They've always been, also been privatized. They are not in private hands. Now, those people who have bought them are probably sourcing their materials from abroad, not from Ajakuta. But then they've been privatized. So they are also out of government consideration now. The three of them have been privatized. Sorry, the question that then comes to mind is, if, they've all, if those that are supposed to be the off-takers from Ajakuta have been privatized, if Ajakuta starts to work, and they will produces. run to Ajakuta, in fact. <laughs> because, it can, it, I mean, you just said, if I have to import my raw materials, look at the cost, logistics, and now my raw material is just next door. Won't I, choose my, won't I change my supply immediately? If Ajakuta comes on stream today, those industries will function uh, better. The, I, mean, I wanted to choose my word. They yes, function because better. they are no longer in yes. government hands, so you are not They're able not to even just there. that. Because now the raw material is at hand. They don't have to wait for imports. You know, you place order. Yes, you know, they, they ship it down. There's clearing. Then there is, of course, logistics. transportation from, from wherever from the, the ship ports. drops it. Yes, to your place. Now you're just getting it next door. Ajakuta to Joss to Shogo to Casina Rolling Mill. It's just down the line, down the road. I know. With the, I must say this: the rail line has been taken over by the Ministry of Transport. This is now. what I wanted to ask you because it's been taken over. You've mentioned that rail thing three times, and yes. I wanted to say, good. That would this would need to form part of what you're looking at because if there's supposed to be a rail line from Itakwe to Alaja, there's supposed to be a steel, uh, uh, another rail line to uh, Ajakuta. Line. Line. Okay, and then uh, you have the federal government. As you're doing all this, the federal government is building other rail lines elsewhere. The question is this. Is this plan that was formed then, that had these rail lines, part of is your ministry working with the Ministry of Transport to ensure that in all the things that they are building, they don't forget that if Ajakuta starts working, they are going to need to rehabilitate at the very least these lines that have essentially been Let unused. me take the word from your mouth. Right. That line, there's something on the, on the social media recently. Okay. That is now being used for commercial purpose. It's running passengers and goods from... Worry, Alaja is in the worry, mm. all the way to Abuja now. Well, it's been taken over by the Federal Ministry of Transport. The line's been rehabilitated. That does not take it away from the fact that the steel system will still use the same rail line. Right now, with that, the steel system is still coming up. It's being used for this co pure, commercial pure goods commercial. And, uh, 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 and passengers. Now, what they're doing more that's going to be beneficial to us, that rail line was like from Itakwe to Alaja, it, uh, it acquired to Ajakuta, so it's one straight line. Now, what the government is doing, they've awarded a contract. They are taking that line from Alaja, the rail line, to the new worry port. So you can even bring in uh, your imported materials and take that line all the way to Abuja. Now, the line is being taken further. Sorry, I've just mentioned Abuja. They're taking it from Ajakuta now. They are bringing it all the way to Ajakuta. Uh, to to Abuja. Abuja. To join the Lagos Canal line. Which means that, I mean, if, when it's completed, it, will, it should go yeah. all the way across the country. Yes, it's going to form the central spine, you know, for rail transportation in Nigeria. And a lot of mining activity is tied to that. We are now going to create spores to mining centers from that central spine. Whether it's going to be by, directly by rail or we're going to use land transport 
So bring it to the nearest rail station and then you transport downwards. Because most of the products that you get, you know, from your mining are either for exports or to other parts of the country. Yeah, where they are to be used. Yeah. So, yes. So they're going to come in, uh, uh, whatever you get your products, you're going to come into that central rail line, which transverse from the port now. It's going to come from Wari Port, the new Wari Port, and come all the way to join the Lagos Canal Line, you know, but in Abuja. So the, right now, work is going on to take it from Ajakuta to bring it to Abuja to join the uh, uh, Lagos, La Lagos Canal Line. So this is part. Now we're working together in synergy with the Federal Ministry of Transportation to make sure that mining gets the infrastructure it needs. I must always chip this in. There's another private uh, uh, incentive which we have signed into. We had to uh, allow them to do that. Ceiling. They are doing. They are dredging River Niger now. I must say, this is the way Ajakuta was built. Most of the equipment in Ajakuta are too heavy. They were brought in through River Niger. Yes. yes. And in any yes. case, the so power flat, the way flat, the place flat is bottom built. barges. Now, people are going back to that. There's a company that's doing that. It's called Sealing. They're going to be transporting goods because it's even cheaper than real. With these flat bottom barges, right now we've signed uh, an MOU with them uh, because they're going to be using our Ajakuta. We've got world class uh, dock facilities in Ajakuta. Yes. They're going to be using that. And right now, they are doing charting and navigational aids for uh, River Niger. And they're also doing dredging. River Niger is navigable about six to seven months in a year. So you can time in and bring in all your goods, take, in, take out your goods. It's only in the dry season when the water is low. You might well, not. Yeah. But even now, technology is such that if we have a little draft, the flat bottom badges will still go. So we, in, in the nearest future, we'll be able to have uh, navigation on River Niger uh, all through, all, all through, through the years. years. I want to also raise the issue of security. All these things you've mentioned uh, as being already uh, would be considering our situation, general situation in terms of security, would be considered prime targets for possible sabotage uh, to prevent this from being actualized. Is that being factored in as well, or we'll cross it when we get there? Well, for instance, when I came into office, the first thing I challenged is that why are we still paying so much in terms of salaries and monuments to Ajakuta when they're not producing? But I took that back immediately. I got to Ajakuta myself for the first time. The only reason why you have an Ajakuta that you visited in 2004, 2007, is because there are people there. You know the typical Nigerian thing. Everything that will have been vandalized, smelted, and may, maybe used to make pots and pans and spoons somewhere else. The way some of our bridges, yes. the, the balustrades. The balustrades. Some of our I mean, uh, when the Lagos Ibadan was launched, Lagos Ibadan Expressway was yes. launched in 1978, 79, when it was launched, it had crash barrier all the way from beginning to the end, about 120 kilometers of it. Not a single scrap is left today. The metal has been taken away, smelted, and used to make uh, pots and pans. So Ajakuta will have suffered the same fate, if not that the people are there. So Ajakuta is secure. People that have been trained, people whose lives were built around Ajakuta, they're still there. You know, people live there. If I recently, I got some complaints from uh, the residents around Ajakuta, who are not even government employees, who use the Ajakuta clinic. It's a full-fledged hospital. And the people far and wide, they use it. They were complaining about, you know, some of the doctors have retired, they've not been replaced. There is this thing in government now freezing on uh, unemployment. So uh, we've lost some few hands maybe to retirement and, and all that, and we've not been replaced. We've had to make do with uh, uh, copper doctors who are, who are there. So these are some of the facilities that are in Ajakuta that are still running. They are functioning. If you go to Ajakuta today, they can do what they call a dry run for you. They will yes, do a dry they run. They did for us. Yes, but yes they will do a dry run. Then, yeah. So the people there are maintaining the equipment. As far as most of the mechanical equipment in Ajakuta is concerned, there's no problem. They are all and ready to go. What we'll be looking at essentially in the in the technical it will probably be uh, uh, the cablings, you know, because in those days it was analog, it went digital, now it's the LTE that everybody's using. So they may have to upgrade the electrics in Ajakuta. They have to look at the cablings and all that. But essentially, the mechanical parts, the parts that are moving them, they've kept, they've kept them in very good conditions. They've been well hauled, they've been well serviced. And of course, that's why they're able to do those dry runs that they do for us. So in terms of security, Ajakuta is well secured. 
because the people are there and they're maintaining the facilities there as best as they can. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to other mining things, we call them country risk. And of course, uh, will be investors will not learn how to manage them. Uh, the few Nigerians are pro providing logistics for investors and they can hold, the, hold them by the hand and guide them through the country risk. Every country comes with that. Uh, one of the major mining destinations in the world today is uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. And we all know what that country is. If it was, uh, there was a failed state, that's uh, one. But then, the big major miners, uh, the Rio Tinto are there, the BHP Pilintin are there, you know, everybody's there. They're mining copper, they're mining uh, all these minerals there. So they're managing the country risk. As we end this, uh, our discussion has been fairly technical because this is a fairly technical su uh, subject that we've tackled. But I want to speak to you generally now. Um, a lot of people have affairs for the country uh, with all the, even some of the things that you and I have spoken about. They talk about security, they talk about its politics, the economy, uh, and if and how the country is going to survive. Again, we're approaching another election. Um, and of course, the temperature is beginning to rise again, as it always does in this period. What would you say to those people who harbor such fears? Well, I think Nigeria will overcome uh, its challenges. These are challenges that I see, uh, but we can surmount. And sincerely, I want to reassure uh, Nigerians, non-Nigerians, who are looking at this and say, look, yes, Nigeria's got a bright future ahead. One, what's most important? For any nation uh, is the human factor and Nigerians have the right spirit the can do spirit and I think we'll get there with this spirit we'll get there we'll overcome our challenges it, 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 it's all part of pain of nationhood we're going through let's say the, the, the pangs and uh, um, all the challenges that comes with nationhood it's been exacerbated especially by current realities by technology. Now anything happening somewhere is blown out of proportion through the social media. Even some outright falsehood, you know, created in social media. People, somebody sits in the corner of his room and manufactures something that does not exist. And that's where a uh, medium like you, thank God, uh, comes in and says, okay, let's confirm. Is China talking about this, whether it has happened or not? Uh, but like I said, beyond all this, the average Nigerian is an enterprising person. They tell me and they can do spirit. And I think with all this, Nigeria will come its challenges and we merge uh, a much better, stronger nation. Honorable okay. Minister, good luck and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ladia Kedari. That's News Night today. Thanks for watching. Would like to know what you think of the issues raised during this conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Dunduale. Goodbye.